Great! It is nighttime, boys and girls, and we, well, in the Subaru universe, um, and we are going to jump right into episode 8 of ReZero, the last episode before the big pause. I'm really looking forward to what Subaru speech has actually set in motion and what we're gonna see right now because this is the beginning of the real counterattack. I named like episode 4 counterattack, but I think this is the beginning of the real counterattack after that speech we had and now Subaru being like we actually need to re reconquer all of these towers. So let's get into it. Let's see who we're focusing on this time, if we're actually focusing on everybody, or if we just have specific playing fields that we're, that we're showing at first, and then we're going, like, after the pause, we're going into the other ones. We'll see about that. I, for one, can't wait to see this, and can't wait to go into it afterwards and talk a little bit about it, and see, like, maybe paint a little bit of a picture of what, what we can expect without any spoilers, of course. Uh, I do hope you're gonna be there for it and let's get this party started re-zero season three episode eight starts in a three a two a one a bam the gang's back together mm -hmm. だが、英知の書は、英知の書か。うん。そんなものが実在するんだろうか。すみません。英知の書ですが。うお、アドノス。ストーバーズ、ライクワットファ。ストーバーズ、ライクユー。で、お前が英知の書を詳しくは後で。
Alright, so he's still scheming. He's a good ally. その分の警戒は僕がしているつもりですから。その分の警戒って内政官として接する機会が多かったこの 1 きっとそれが役立つ時が来る。いや、I'll do it on my own, that's nice. By the way, I just wanted to say, what if Otto's worry and restoring the Tome of Wisdom is actually gonna lead to Roswell acquiring it again and then scheming again because of that? So... <laughs> Kind of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Hmm. Now that makes sense. She's probably not... Ooh. Okay. She's probably not in a condition to fight. Holy shit, feelers. Is that like... Blood on your face? She probably spitting blood or something. It's terrible. Yeah, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? She looks a lot worse than him. He can't do anything right now. Ooh, holy shit. It's not healing. What the fuck? But he can. Ooh. And it's painful, huh? Because he was infected with it too, right? Probably. Real, I mean, ah, yeah, but it doesn't hurt him, right? It's just temporary for him, for it's the debilitating. Oh, 
He took on the responsibility, right? This is what it means. Yeah, so we win, and in the end, we can do more for her. No, I get him. No, I 100% get him. For that, actually, let's stop for a second. I just want to re empathize how hard it must be for Felis, right? To be like the knight of, of your ruler, right? That you've, you've chosen to follow, that you are. Possibly even more than that, right? Because Felix has feelings for Krush. And I think she's reciprocating, at least before she lost her memories and all that, and maybe even right now. There's a, a lot of closeness between the two of them. And to have, like, the person you love the most in this world, and you, you can help everybody else, right? But you can't help that person specifically. It must be very painful. You feel like the, the, the how useless you feel as a result of that, right? How much you blame yourself for not being powerful enough, right? For not being knowledgeable enough, for not being able to actually help them. It's like a doctor, for example, not being able to help their wife or girlfriend or whatever when she is in grave, grave danger or has some like debil debilitating illness not being able to help them because you are not specialized in that, right? And you don't know anybody who is, right? Because maybe the sickness is very rare or whatever, and you don't know a solution for it yet. You don't even know what it is, really. That's the insane thing, right? Like, that, that feeling of not being able to do anything, despite all of your knowledge, despite all of the skill that you have, despite all of the confidence you held in your own abilities. And then to realize that some things some things you can't fix, right? Possibly, at least, right? There's still the hope, and Subaru holds that hope, and, and Willem here definitely, probably also holds that hope. But Felix is in a moment of hopelessness right now, and he is, he's at the brink of, like, losing his morale, losing, losing all of this stability that he has within himself, and this is why he needs to, actually. And he takes that moment, right, to process that and talk to her, and Maybe now that she's in a little bit less pain, right? That Subaru's taken it with the hand and whatnot. Maybe now we can actually we can actually talk it out and Felix can to a degree process it and understand helping all of the people out there now is making sure that down the line they can help Cruz. Much like Subaru kind of was in a similar situation with Rem. Couldn't help Rem anymore, right? But understood that the only way for him to actually help Rem in the long term is going forward and finding some way to actually eventually reverse what, what happened to her. Willem knows Kurgan. Ooh, holy shit. Yeah, eight arms. Died over ten years ago. Both of them, both of them died, supposedly. It's it might be something somebody else learned and picked up. 
屍兵と呼ばれていました屍兵ラインハルトには伏せておいていただけませんか Yeah, this would be difficult for him. It's his mother. Oh, we explain more about divine protections. Right, so it's distinct. A divine protection that is passed down in the family. It is almost a divine will, right? Appointing somebody. No. Before she died. Before she died. Spoken in anger. But he thinks he does, right? He feels he does. Maybe we need to bank on that fact. That is one thing that I wanted to kind of just highlight, which is very interesting. That I don't know which series I've heard it in. It might be Arcane. Um, that there's a clear disconnect between what we logically know that is true and what we feel is true oftentimes, right? Like even if we can process something and we can understand that something is logically not our fault, that doesn't mean that we will feel that way, right? And I guess that inherently comes just from from the way our emotions work, right? That sometimes, sometimes we don't know all of the information. And if we don't know all of the information, it's always plausible, of course, that we could have done something. We, we could have done something or that could have prevented something bad from happening or maybe through some unknowing way, we are still responsible for something. Or people blame us, despite us not being responsible. But there's this negative feeling and emotion, and people's beliefs hold a lot of weight, especially if they're people very closely connected to us, like your your grandfather, for example, in this specific case, who who is out of anger, out of frustration, out of deep grief, and maybe also just self-loathing, throws that throws that guilt onto somebody else, somebody who hasn't deserved it, right? Somebody who's like maybe just a victim of circumstantial evidence. That is the first time in this series that we've seen Reinhardt actually taking an L, kind of, right? Reinhardt being the victim of something. Because normally he's so strong, he's so beyond all of this, but we do see that when he was a child and th this heavy burden was put onto him, not only did it put like a future in front of him that was kind of set in stone and that was kind of like putting the weight of the world on him, but also making him responsible for any kind of tragedy that wasn't prevented because he might have been capable of doing so if he was at the right place at the right time but even then like just that in the moment that he gained this responsibility and power and this huge pressure right that his grandmother like as a result of that his grandmother died which is absolutely devastating right and survivor guilt is a real thing and this is a very good case of survivor's guilt. Like a very exemplary case of survivor's guilt. You're <laughs> like, I'm gonna get that bitch. Yeah, she sees the potential in Liliana. 
<laughs> right fool. <laughs> <laughs> Your stupidity. <laughs> what are you cooking, Reinhardt? What are you cooking? Divine protection. Telepathy. Ooh, interesting. How does it work in this specific? She hasn't discovered that? Yeah, tickle her ego. Good idea. Actually, great idea. Hmm. So we need good fighters. A lot of them probably. Good one, Willem. Ooh, Garfield immediately peeks it. もう片方の女も同じような立場だろうや。そして死者を恥ずかしめる鹿羽兵の近術は。it kind of makes sense, right? Thematically. That is a big task. Mm, but I need you there. Mimi. Yeah. Regain your honor. <laughs> mm. We need you somewhere else, though, right? He's like, I can deal with it. We need you against... against Regulus. Yeah. <laughs> Strong and versus invincible. That is powerful. I'll put my trust in you. I wonder what that comment was about. Hmm. 
This is very interesting. <laughs> right. Okay, I wonder. We probably have some runtime left, right? Ooh. Okay. Nighttime wedding. どうしてその番号だけ空席に。うん、who was that? I wonder. ね、レグルス。実は僕の方からも話しておきたいことがあってね。大丈夫。妻として当然の心得みたいなものさ。まず第一に僕と結婚した後、君には笑顔を禁じる。普通にしてたら可愛い、綺麗なのに笑うとブスになる子っているじ
Door in the face. <laughs> he got hurt. Mm. The heroes of the story. <laughs> the one I'll love someday. Holy shit. Dude pulled the Uno reverse card. <laughs> the biggest out of all of the Uno reverse cards. Really amazing. I, I, I bet he always wanted to do that crash a wedding. But not in that way. Not in that way. Having to do it in that way can be kind of problematic, especially against an opponent like this. Let me, um, and on the screen, we start out at night, which sets up this entire, this entire counter attack to be at night, which is insane, right? I can, I said that earlier, right? I cannot imagine the light show that's gonna go down, but it's gonna be gorgeous, I am pretty sure. And I do feel like a night setting will be perfect for some of these fights. Right, especially if you see the the matchups, Julius is, and Anastasia, not Anastasia, but Julius and Ricardo are gonna go against Gluttony, which will be a super hard fight, I would assume. Right, especially even if they have support of like the um, the Hoshin Company, right, uh, the Iron Fang or whatever they're called. And Subaru and and Reinhardt going up against Regulus feels like Reinhardt's gonna win win easy, but. You don't know, right? Because Regulus is seemingly invin invincible, and we've seen that before multiple occasions g against multiple enemies too, right? Like even Pandora, can you just put him into the ground, but she couldn't kill him, right? She could just whisk him away with her weird dimensional bending like powers or whatever. Priscilla, I gotta say, like when I first actually read that Priscilla and Liliana going up against Raph kind of puzzled me, but then when it was explained, I was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? Liliana's ability to kind of just sway the masses with her music, right? Touch the people's hearts, right? And lift them up, much like Subaru did. I, I found that very funny when they had like the conversation and, and Priscilla was like, that's what you have been doing, fool, right? And she just, she couldn't help but just put in that last little just knock on his head, calling him fool, but yeah. and. It makes sense for Priscilla too, because Priscilla seems to be that kind of person who is seeing herself high and mighty above other people in status, but also seems to have that natural charisma, at the very least in like episode one, we have seen like explained what the royal candidates were doing in that like one year time skip since season two and the sanctuary and whatnot, or even like before that, because the sanctuary stuff obviously happened in isolation. We didn't know what all the other camps were doing. And Priscilla seemed to have been very, very popular among parts of the of the population. So it makes perfect sense that Priscilla, especially also with her like her appearance in the last couple of episodes where she danced to to Liliana's song and, and whatnot, that the two of them would be a very good, a very good combo to actually fight against somebody like Raph, whose atmosphere is basically making everybody sync up and go crazy and like dragging them down with negative emotions. The perfect opposite of that is somebody who seemingly thinks or maybe even has the entire universe on her side when it comes to luck like Priscilla who is very charismatic and somebody who actually can touch the heart of people right and lift them up so it makes perfect sense to do that now Garfield and and Willem against the two swordsmen we had that before and they were really struggling so I do feel like this is gonna be a make it or break it because the two of them actually alone against lust Right? If, if like the two swordsmen alone, if they fight them, that's fine. But if they go in and they fight Lust in addition to that, how how are they gonna do that? Right? Do they have somebody else there who's who's gonna support them because they need somebody? If one of each of them is fighting the other, right? Willem fighting his wife or his his wife's reanimated corpse, I guess, and Garfield fighting like one of the most notorious like fighters or generals of another empire, which is the Wallachian Empire, which is, uh, I think, like they said, it's 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 bordering on one of the sides of like the 
or of Lagunica. So it's one of the the empires which have been um, partially also here and there in conflict with Lagunica in the past. So it's very interesting to see like Garfield going up against somebody who's so high and mighty, right? Eight arms and whatnot, strong as fuck. So they, they really have to pull out their, the last part of their strength. But obviously, Subaru was right. He has kind of a score to settle, right? Mimi got hurt and, and he lost against him last time. So I do feel like if he goes into that battle and he prepares himself well and he actually manages to go get out of that victorious, that will be a, a giant boost to his self-confidence and maybe a giant dampener on all of these self-doubts that Garfield has been struggling with in this very season. And Willem, for Willem, it's obviously a matter of settling emo on an emotional level, right? Uh, Reinhardt himself said it, Willem is not calm emotionally, but right, his master got hurt, that's one thing. And the second one is like, he's highly disturbed because somebody could be misusing the corpse of his wife, which we say the corpse of his wife, it's very interesting because what we're, what we're implying here is that this might not be somebody who is all the way up to the standards his wife was when she was alive, right? So maybe this is why he can beat her. He beat her before, right? In pure skill, but even right, like now that he's past his prime, maybe he can beat her because she's also past her prime because she's actually just an instrumentalized corpse more or less very interesting that divine blessing of of her right the death god or whatever it was called is still active despite her supposedly being a corpse so very very interesting also very interesting that there is actual real life necromancers in this universe that's that's kind of really cool and also dangerous pot potentially down the line but yeah let's let's see how this goes uh, we have a lot of talking don't don't need to highlight too much like I've, I've highlighted most of this just now i do love some of these shots when priscilla is coming in again we zoom in on like the, the her her smirk and whatnot and her rolling out her fan the shoes and whatnot she's making a grand entrance i do love how she interacts with al actually he's like going in he's like i was so worried i didn't find you and she's just redirecting his energy onto <laughs> It's just falling, falling down there. Weird. I actually I heard that that one of the episodes showed Al's face, but I didn't see anything in the last couple of episodes. Um, maybe that was kind of uh, somebody just lying out of their ass, because I know it was information that got dropped before the episode, so it's very interesting. <laughs> having her foot on him again. <laughs> I mean, I, he's probably into it. Let's be honest. Um, a lot of people would be into that as well. Shout out to Ed. <laughs> uh, that ugly broadcast from earlier. I'm always fair when it comes to results. She's like, you you were kind of effective, okay? It's very interesting how Alice being... Alice being a good knight, right? He's he's being protective of her. She's like, you. we should get out of here. And then Priscilla is like, are you implying that I wouldn't stand and fight? Are you implying P I would lose? <laughs> it's, right, all of these implications in there, I would lose, I would be a coward, I would like... This is not her style, if all the other candidates are staying. But she's not that selfish. You couldn't be more mistaken. Right, it's very interesting how she's like being offended by that. And we're using that time to talk about Rosewell and his plans. I already talked about that in the episode. I think it's very cool that Otto is thinking thinking ahead he's like this could be a problem down the line let me just get some more info on this but like i said it could easily just restore the book and then we have the book again and then roswell gets his hands on it and suddenly right he's gonna make trouble again down the line we don't know that but otto is like i can take care of myself i'ma be fine don't you worry about it but i can make this happen and we meet Krusan. this is one of the big moments of this very cool how we have like the the difference between like the dark shadowy room of like her right you would be used to right if somebody's like somebody's like hurt right or or ill or whatever you'd keep them in a in a dark room and you you'll make sure that they get a lot of rest and whatnot but i don't know if if rest is going to be enough for krush and we do see that i mean i gotta say she's she's still looking pretty <laughs> uh, peak design that's just how it is but yeah um Obviously, this is a giant wound, basically, a giant festering wound on her. Um, and it's causing her a lot of pain and weakness. 
which doesn't seem to be the case in Subaru's case. I love how we're putting this shot with her like in the foreground, but she's out of focus and we have Subaru and Felix looking onto her in focus. And in this frame is like Subaru is very like there's a lot of despair on his face and we have just a glimmer of light on his face. The rest is all dark and we see it like he's drooping in, in terms, terms of like how his how his posture is. It Everything kind of just re-empathizes how he feels about the situation. Devastated, right? shocked, all of these things. You do see that in his face, in his posture and everything. And for Felix, it's just like, we, like we said during the episode, it's going into the, the region of hopelessness, right? The drooping ears, like the, the, the sad, painful eyes. The, and what I really notice in this shot is that Felix is very small in this frame, right? She seems very small and insignificant in this frame. This is how she's, uh, he, she, he, sorry. All the time, all the fucking time. Um, he is very small and insignificant seeming in this very frame. So he, this is how he feels, powerless, um, right? Completely at the mercy of what's happening here and unable to help the person he wants to help the most. This looks painful. Like, look at all the blood and whatnot. The wounds are not healing, and and she's like, but he's trying to to touch the hand, which like insane angle, by the way. Um, and he touches it, and the, the, the sparks are flying basically in his head, and he's like feeling the the pain, and suddenly something transferred onto his hand. But he's not feeling the pain permanently. He's just feeling it for a short second or like a couple of seconds and then it's gone. The hand is still ruined and maybe it hurts like it, like it aches or something, but it doesn't hurt the, the way it hurts for Cruz, which is insane. And he obviously immediately he's going for the face and he's like, I can't do anything to help her. Like scoot over, I'll, I'll double check this. I'll, I'll see if it works. And it's, it's like the dragon's blood is transferring to his body and going into his bloodstream. Interesting how he's getting purple while he like while that's happening, right? Like the, the red and the atmospheric, like the atmosphere of red, it's it's screaming pain. But I do wonder what the purple is meaning because we use the purple a lot for Subaru's like agony and anguish in in previous seasons as well. He takes in as much as he can, and she's kind of like her face is mostly mostly fine again, but obviously a lot of her body is still affected. But she's like, no, you can't do that. And we talk back and forth. He's like, a little bit of pain is nothing for me. But she's like, I don't want you to take it in so much that it's de debilitating you, right? That it's preventing you from actually doing something in the hours and days to come because we need you. Losing both of us is not going to be in any way significant. And we need you. If we're both unable to, to fight, the outcome might be fatal. You said it yourself. You took on these responsibilities, and this is when we realize, right? I mean, Subaru kind of knew that from the start, but this kind of re-empathizes this. When you take on the responsibilities of more than just you, and you promise people, I'm gonna fix this, right? Take the weight of the world on your shoulders. It's not just the challenge that's ahead, right? It's not just the, the difficulties that lie ahead in order to achieve that. It's also that you have to be a lot more mindful and responsible for what you're doing and how you're putting yourself in harm's way. Because if you yourself are going to get damaged or die or or are unable to do anything as a result of your actions, it will be your fault that you, you can't fulfill your promises to the people that you made the promises to. And I think what's kind of a little bit reminiscent of that, I would say, is being a parent, right? When you become a parent and you... you, you your children, um, your children are reliant on you, right? You're, you, you're their caretaker, their primary person of emotional and, and mental support. You are the person who lifts them up and, and helps them fulfill their potential, the person who is there to protect them, the person who is there to provide for them. And as a parent, you take on not just the responsibility of yourself, right? For example, when you look for, when, when, when you look for changing your jobs because your job isn't doing isn't isn't going so great right it's, it's a lot more difficult you need to be sure that you have another job before you before you quit your current job that that's not working well or maybe that's causing you pain and suffering because you can't just hope that you get something because if you don't and you fail and 
you're getting into debt and you're getting like difficulties uh, getting getting the food on the table and whatnot it's your children who will be suffering for that right if you start traveling around you can't just start traveling around the country willy-nilly without um, taking precautions and being like okay let me look how we can arrange that for my children to still go to school and learn things and have their friends and whatnot and have grow up in a normal environment that is healthy for them and is is good for them and that isn't damaging them you can't just travel around the world all the time and just not look for that beforehand you t have to take a lot of precaution to actually make sure that all of that is accounted for and you make sure that your children are all right with that and that everything works out fine before you can ever think about something like that right there's a lot more focus on security and making sure that your children are safe in any event rather than like you just having to be responsible for yourself and then being like okay if something bad happens and something bad bad happens that's just it right it's way easier to be like okay if i get into an accident if i like or if i run run out of money times might be a little bit tough but it's gonna be fine right i'll handle it but if if there's like two children three children behind you that rely on you completely that can't do that themselves right uh be responsible for them at that age then you can't do that right you can't just be like oh whatever and i think that is the same here right on a grander scale you are responsible for all of these civilians these innocent people children women old people right but also even the the, the able-bodied men and women who are at an age where they can still fight and then and, and where they can still provide for themselves but we are in a crisis situation and your, your actions will be determining if we get out of the situation with minimal damages or not, with minimal casualties or not, right? With people being in despair and absolutely traumatized and devastated or people actually coming out of this and maybe being a little bit traumatized, but understand like processing it properly and, and, and realizing that, yeah, we got through this together, right? Because we relied on this person and we were there for each other and... But if that person suddenly is taken out, you take all of that hope you've just given them and, and and just put them even deeper into despair. And this is what you can't do. Mm. There's a smile between the two of them. You can leave everything to me. You're right, right? You, Subaru's taking advice. He's like, you're you're correct. And he's turning his back on her. I love how like the half shadow, half light. And even like a little bit more shadow on his face. Like the, the, the diagonal. It's not like the clear one that we always see. It's like... A different kind of lighting it's like taking his check and then it's like we still need your help as well we need you Felix, right so you can help your loved one later because if we lose all of this if like everything falls apart then you won't be able to help cruise either and these are the hard decisions you gotta make beautiful gorgeous shot by the way the hard decisions you gotta make yeah right? the re resolutions you gotta come to the resolve you have to gather to be like, yeah, I understand. Understand that this is painful right now and I feel helpless and hopeless and whatnot. But I need to gather all of my all of my strength, all of my all of my resolve, all of my like self-confidence, scrape it all up, stand upright, <laughs> stiffen up that upper lip as uh as Eminem likes to say. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm quoting Eminem. I like that part of the song. <laughs> Um, Mockingbird, by the way, that's the song. Um, and just, just go get through this, right? Help people in order to be able to help yourself and your loved ones later on, because this is not something you can solve right here, right now. It's something you can only solve when we're actually getting through this in one piece, all of us. Will Element Subaru strategizing. The glint in Willem's eye is not one of insecurity. It is one of determination, and I do love that because it shows that Willem despite all of like the the stuff that's shaking up his feelings we realized that a couple of episodes ago here and there right where he's like he's grabbing his shoulder and he's kind of getting like chittery and whatnot but here he is he's gathering his resolve as well he's like don't worry i need to share this with you i've made my peace with it and i've come to the resolution i want to come to and this is what i'm going to do and now we sit on the table right <laughs> Great shot, by the way. The way it's like the fan splits the frame. Cool. And we start planning. We start mapping this out, right? Where's the districts? Who is taking care of what? Love how we're how we're doing a lot of these things. 
the divine protection of judgment and he's looking upon her and it's telepathy. I do wonder why Liliana has telepathy, but I guess like it's not straight up telepathy as in I can talk to people through their minds, but more like telepathy in the way that I can transfer my energy, right? My feelings, my like what I want to convey to people very well, which could be an inherited divine protection by for all we know, because we know now that some divine protections can be inherited, like the one of the sword saint. So maybe this is also because like all of her family was bards, her mother, her grandmother. So it's very well possible that she herself kind of inherited that telepathy divine protection. And that is why why beyond her skill and her, her amazing lyrical talent, she can also just transfer her energy onto people and make them believe. It's like, I just, okay, wait, I did, I did skip over that. You said you just received, he just received, like, he's just receiving divine protections as he goes. He's like, oh, I have a new divine protection, I guess. <laughs> it's like, make it make, make it make sense, okay? Make it make sense, Reinhardt, what the fuck, dude? Bro, like, somebody nerf Reinhardt, please, somebody nerf Reinhardt. Words you would never hear in Overwatch, by the way. Then you can see that the songs you've inherited from your ancestors have lost, right? She's like prodding Liliana and it's so easy for her because she, she exactly she knows what she's doing but Liliana is like childish I don't even know how old she is she's probably a teenager so makes perfect sense right she's childish and whatnot and she's like just poking her ego she's like you're saying that all of that is like it was for nothing it's useless it, 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 it will lose right you're not capable right and she's like you're gonna go there okay <laughs> I'll show you but yeah, sometimes this is all we need, right? Like a little bit of a, a little bit of a like prodding, prodding and poking our ego and being like, well, I, I thought you would do, but uh, I guess you're not good enough. And then people are like, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> and I love it. Eight arms and we're talking it out. We're talking it out. I'm going to skip over this a little bit. I do love, I do love these interactions between Reinhardt and Subaru. Uh, what was that about? Okay, let me see. Sorry to... Okay. Uh, we go with that and we're like, I will act as Subaru's um, assistant. Sorry to just keep asking favors of you. I'll do whatever I can to cover for anything you're lacking. He's lacking very little though, but <laughs> anyway. He's like, oh, wait, wait, what was that? What's up? He's smiling. I suppose it's a trivium, tr trivial matter to you. Hmm... I do wonder why he smiled like that and was thinking that, right? Was saying that. Maybe he means like, it is so inspiring to have somebody who has so many apparent flaws, which Subaru admits himself, right? A character who's very flawed, but very good at heart, of course, and, and has their strength and whatnot. Just be so incredibly positive about it, right? To understand, yes, I am flawed, I can't help you much, but... I'll I'll be ready to try whatever I can to cover for everything you're lacking in. Like I don't know like if f first of all there's going to there would be a lot of people who who are like who are like Subaru and saying yeah I'm kind of like I can't help much but yeah I'm going to try right I'm going to try to constantly reach beyond my means but also I do wonder how many people would actually say that in Reinhardt's face be like I'm gonna cover where you're lacking, right? In that way, because people people put Reinhardt on this pedestal, right? He's he's up there for everybody and he's seemingly perfect for almost everybody. I have faith that you will fill in the areas where I fall short. And he's just reciprocating. Feel free to get your hopes up and he has that glimmer in his eye, this tenacity. Because I'm placing all hopes in you. And this is what we do. This is what we do, okay? We hold together. Right? I'm placing my hopes in you and your strengths. You're placing your hope in me and my strengths. Don't disappoint me. I won't disappoint you. I trust you. I know you can do it. Right? All of these things. They seem trivial in like how we say them. Right? How we put them out. How we just push responsibilities onto others. But not in an unfair way. But more in a way of I know you can do this, right? I, I think you're reliable. I trust you as a person because we do have that personal connection and I know what you're capable of. And we have that unwavering, unwavering trust and bond between us. 
reconfirming that over and over because this is like all kinds of stories across time, right? And a lot of them focus on this, on this mutual respect and trust, mutual understanding, right? Helping each other, filling out each other's weaknesses, right? Unwavering trust that the other is gonna find a way. And we have that between Subaru and Amelia, we have that between Subaru and Reinhardt here, Subaru and Julius in the past, Subaru and Krush earlier, right? This is what makes us us, right? These bonds, these people who we, we know on a deep level, who we can rely on, who we can connect to. And even if we don't know every aspect of them, we know enough of them, we have spent enough time with them, we've connected enough with them on an emotional level that we do have that assurance, we do have that security in our beliefs that they, they will come through for us. And that is that is something that has been in stories ever since stories were first created, right? Written down or captured in, in like a visual media like this one. It's always been there. These are kind of the tales that we all look up to, isn't it? Right? Tales of heroism, tales of people people going beyond their own means, right? People reaching, reaching for the sky, not in an arrogant or dismissive way, but in a way of of hope and and self-confidence and and trust in the bonds they forged, right? Brothers in battle, sisters in battle, right? This is why they touch us so much, because there's like an inherent human quality to them, an inherent human quality to to the connections we make, right? To the to the trust we place in other people. And it's really great to see that it, it doesn't get old. It doesn't. It really does not get old. And this is why I loved like the last speech in, in episode seven, right? Why it touched me on such a such an amazing level, because this is what I love, right? You empathize with people, you you understand them, and then you lift them up and you remind them that they are not alone in this world. Because it's by God, it's so it's so easy to get into your own head. It's so easy to to think that you are alone in this world, that 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 nobody really cares for you. Be that because suddenly you're you're not getting any responses from people anymore, or people like push you away out of their lives because of some some stupid squabble or something you said or something you don't even know what happened, right? Or Right? But oftentimes it's it's just that non-communication that's that's the problem, right? We don't talk it out, we don't process it, and then then th th that little cut we have becomes a festering wound. It it swells and, and, and it hurts and it pains and it spreads over in other areas. And this is how division works, right? Divide and conquer. That's why since ancient times, people who want to gain power, who want to who want to win the battle against people against people who are more than them, who are stronger than them or whatever, what they do is they divide them, they find issues to, to separate them and to put them against one another, to make them distrust one another. Because that, like, the, the, what is the medicine, what is the recipe, what is the antidote for that? It is, it is unwavering trust, unshakable bonds, it's, it's like the bonds we make through these experiences, right? Hard times, going through the hard times together, relying on one another, helping one another, understanding that even if somebody fails in something, that they, they have that unshaking, unwavering co conviction that they're not useless, but that they they tried their best and they'll try even harder next time and they'll they'll be able to overcome this with the necessary help, with like with joining hands together and all of that. And isn't that what what even the OP and the ED are of this se season of ReZero are singing about? Isn't that what the main theme is throughout the OP? <laughs> that we grasp these strands of, of of destiny, right? These 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 threats of fate with our own hands, with our hearts joined, resonating as one. I love that metaphor from the OP that that we go into this, right? Like that we connect that to resonating with one another both on the one hand in in form of a song right like who who doesn't like a, 
an amazing song that has these these resonating symphonies, right? These these voices all joined as one, right? The harmonies. And this is what we're talking about. But also, in a way, you could see each and every one of us as individuals, right? As humans. Our bodies are made out of atoms, right? They're made out of matter. And that matter resonates in in some degree, right? It resonates on a certain or on certain frequencies. Now, obviously, right. I don't want to get into the esoteric. That's not what I'm trying to do here. What I'm saying is like, you can see it as a metaphor that all of our bodies, all of our wills, all of our minds are resonating in one frequency and we are going right. And as such, right, we're not disturbing one another, right? We're not breaking each other apart because if you have different frequencies, right, right, they, they change one another, right? And that happens if you have, if you are in a relationship with people, you change one another reaction action and reaction right and it it's a cascade but at the same time once you like these moments where you're all almost think and feel as one where all of your hearts and minds are joined together where you're all focused on the same goals and share the same hopes and and share the same emotional bond when you resonate as one isn't that the beauty of like the beauty of any or most stories that are out there that we all come together and we we are accomplishing something that seems to be beyond our means because of the bonds we forged because of like the the incredible trust we have to one another and this is something that makes me always makes me emotional because i do feel like there is some some deep truth in that that we in everyday life, at the very least, we forget all too often, right? When we're just focused on ourselves or like a couple of single people in our vicinity, which is exactly the idea that Subaru rejects, right? He's like, I'm not going to focus on that single person. Yes, they are my priority, but I want to include all of the people I've met that I've made positive experiences with, that I know are deep down inside are good people. I want to include them in this. And all of the innocent people that, right, that that are not at fault that that for for this tragedy happening, even if somebody is maybe a petty thief or whatever, there's a reason why they are that. And even though it doesn't justify what they're doing, right, the crimes they're they're committing or whatnot, at the very least, I don't wish upon them any more harm than 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 their just punishment for what they did, right? And that should be separate of them being savable, right? Subaru said that in episode 70, not not in the same way, but he said, I don't care. All of these innocent peoples, they're, they're not involved in this. I want to save them all. I want to. First of all, because I want to look good. I want to be the hero, right? We set that up. But second of all, also because I, I, I couldn't forgive myself. These are my ideals. I think everybody has the right to be saved and there shouldn't be, right? There shouldn't be somebody... I should be focusing and exclusively focusing on just to let everybody else around me die because this is not the way to go forward into the future to carry these invisible wounds of guilt right these invisible wounds of like i could have done something and just because i didn't trust myself or didn't trust my allies or didn't think it was possible i didn't make it happen despite it maybe being possible and this is how we're going in um the wedding yeah let's talk about it for a short while we have great angles Obviously, amazing outfit, chosen for for the right occasion, right? And I think like it's um, it's very significant that she's standing to the right of her, right? Because we had her as the main interaction character and the representative for all the other wives, who is like, right, the, the one who maybe got moved by Amelia the most, exposed to Amelia the most so far. Amelia hasn't talked much to the other ones, even though. She, probably interacted with them in one or two sentences here and there. And I think it's amazing how Amelia keeps her calm through this conversation where Regulus is just self-aggrandizing, right? He's setting down the rules, all that does like a row of like all of the wives being there being like, please just fucking kill me. Um, Most of them probably, not all of them, but right. Uh, some of them might have just given up and just they're just dolls at this point but the one to the right of Emilia is definitely somebody who like at least has that little spark of defiance in her and that defiance for her before she met Emilia was obviously in the sense of 
I'm just gonna get myself killed and in the last moment I'm gonna look and smile and be defiant and not listen to him and that's gonna be my victory but now there is hope for more and through the speech and through Amelia's encouragement and what the seat was vacant and he's like he's like there was somebody before that I've that I wanted to be my um my 79th and but but I decided them to to not be I do wonder like if we make a reference like this it needs to be somebody who's actually connected to that to to our stories and whatnot so I do wonder if they're gonna come up right if this is gonna be like something that in in the next couple of episodes right after the pause we're gonna have that revealed to us or if that is something that is maybe in the past right like in the past seasons or something somebody we've met somebody who was connected to us but either way this is significant uh, so he's like before we do that i'd like to tell you i'd like to tell you a piece of my mind and everybody's like shocked and whatnot and first of all he's like acting like cordial and whatnot but he's like common knowledge don't do don't change your facial expression right it, I think this is so it's so insane right right he can't I do wonder why that is right why that is his sensibility that he's like there's there's people like there's girls who look cute when they just have a normal expression but if they smile they're ugly right I mean obviously I I don't remember anybody in my life who is like that but I guess these people exist right who don't look quite as as beautiful as they would if they if they have just a normal facial expression or whatnot when they smile but a smile is always beautiful right in my opinion because a smile carries carries more than more than just like aesthetics but i guess this is all he that matters to him right aesthetics that is his superficial incredibly superficial idea of love right or of admiration or right it's just aesthetic beauty like for him getting a new wife is like acquiring a new painting it's like, yeah, beautiful to look at, but that's all there is to it. This is also very interesting for me with the, like, the virgin question we had, like, two episodes ago. I do think that, like, as much as it sounded sinister, I think all that mattered to him was the purity of mind, right? That she is innocent, in a way, because that carries some kind of beauty, right? In a way, I don't even think that... I, that he is in any way sexually attracted, well, maybe attracted, but not sexually active with his wives, right? I do think that is like a foreign concept to him as well, right? Intimacy. Because how could he, how could he expose himself, right? For example, if he's so insecure on the inside, because he is insecure as fuck on the inside. Look at him, right? He's vain, like he could be the Archbishop of Vanity if that existed, honestly. He could be. He could be pride as well if it existed, though I guess there can be different twists on pride. And pride and greed are very close to one another, right? In some, like, various aspects of whatnot. But he's boasting in many ways, right? He's dressing himself up, right? Surrounding himself with all those riches and all those wives and all of this, this stuff, right? The power and the money and the influence and the beauty. Because that, in a way, I guess, is making himself feel more valuable right and that is i guess his specific niche of what greed is increasing your value over time right all of the pretty clothes all of the pretty wives all of the stuff all of this is value for me because as it is connected to me and it serves me and it belongs to me it means that it is an extension of myself and as and as a result of that, everything that beautiful that I add onto me is something, something that I can boast about, right? Because it's part of myself. But if anything that I boast about that, that's part of that I made part of myself, like my wife's, for example, is not beautiful. Like when they smile, for example, and their face doesn't look as cute if, if they smile, that is an immediate drop in value for my own personal value, right? For my own personal beauty. You see how petty he really is, right? How how incredibly, like, how much of a child is really in that mind. Because he's not only just completely missing the point of what love is about. Missing the point of what even attraction is about. Missing the point of many life's concepts. But also, he, like, even the tiniest, the tiniest 
scratch in his invincible armor is an affront to his entire life because he fears that out of that scratch suddenly there's going to be a crack that cracks his entire core, so to speak. Which, yeah, I mean, this is the core. This is the core of who he is. My compassion is lost on you. Do you perchance have some sort of problem with me? Like, you want to fight me? <laughs> Despite her just being like, look, right? We need to clear something. Like, why? What, what, what are you doing? <laughs> right? She's just being calm and sense here. And she's very calm. He's like almost losing his temper. And the only reason why he's not losing his temper, in my opinion, yet, he's obviously going to do that in just a second, but yet, is that she's so calm about it. And that she's not like, pushing back with passion, but she's pushing back with, like, clear rationale. After I've shown you so much consideration and compromise, right? I've been so nice to you, right? You should be thankful for me giving you this, right? Rules for thee, but not, not for me, right? When, when somebody else would be talking like that to him, he'd be like, you're violating my rights. Who are you to to talk down on me like this, to, to say you're being so compassionate and compromising with me, with, all you're doing is just being selfish, right? This is what he would be throwing at himself if he was looking at himself in the mirror and, like, arguing with himself, basically. You're actively belittling me. That's a violate. right? What did he say? Probably my rights. Yeah, violation. I think marriage is supposed to be a very happy thing, and she just keeps talking, she keeps talking, she's getting across across her her ideals, right? The way she thinks about these things. When they love you in your turn, I think that's a truly amazing thing, and I do think so as well, right? That's a beautiful thing. Why do you address your wives by numbers, right? And he's like, You're, are you criticizing me the way I do things, right? Blah, blah, blah. It's, just, it's very interesting how he twists all of that in his head. You're fixating on what people are called? That's the same as being fixated only on appearances. Aren't you the one only fixated on appearances? Aren't you? Why do you, like, there's this cognitive dissonance, but this is a human ability, right? This is a human, like, characteristic to be cognitively dissonant as fuck, right? You can't do, you can't be that. There's a lot of people who have that extreme cognitive dissonance within them. They, like, don't realize how much they really are contradicting themselves. But it's different when it comes to other things, right? Other situations, other people. The most shallow form of relationship there is, right? Focusing on no, but respecting people, right? But not not in the way you think respect is given or taken. Alright, and she's bringing up Suru and he's like, who is this guy? Who are you talking about? You're mine. <laughs> she's like, well, you're not listening to me. Names carry all sorts of feelings within them, right? They carry meanings, they carry a symbolic thing, right? Speech carries meaning, the way you express yourself. And Regulus should know it, but he doesn't because he is who he is. A man's name, right? He's not someone I don't know well. Super is my one and only knight, and the one who tells me he loves me. And obviously that brings him like to, to the brink. They're all cowering back there. I love this shot, right? How he how he extends the hand back and it's all the way in the like on the on the right side of the screen is very big, right? In in the camera basically. He's taking in space. He's making himself big in this moment. He's like threatening. And he's not even threatening just Amelia, right? He's threatening the girl behind her who he knows Amelia kind of like saved the last time, which means like she cares about her dying or living. And he's like he's imposing that it's basically blackmail at this point but for him it's not right in his twisted mind he twists it in a way that he is the one in the right right and it was only his right to do so and it was only natural that that would follow right because obviously if you slight him like that why would you not expect for him to lose his temper but she keeps talking she doesn't keep talking like she's, she's not pushing back she keeps talking in the same way she's talking the whole time, right? She's making her point. I don't understand what it means. Yeah. And it is, in my opinion, actually more of a more of a testament how mature she is on maybe an emotional level to say, like, I don't understand what that means exactly, at least not for myself. There's many people out there, many adults who are I don't know, in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, who don't understand what it means to love somebody. 
truly love somebody, right? And on on like a very emotional level and everything. There's many people who who wouldn't understand that, but wouldn't realize that themselves. That she is making decision for herself right here, right? Or even earlier, she made that decision in the past. That she's like, I can't give Subaru any answers, right? Not a positive one and not a negative one. Because I do not understand the entirety of what it means. And I want to understand that before I do that. Even though he says he loves me, I can't give him the response, yeah. It's making him suffer, right? Obviously, right? You're in suffering, you're, you're in pain, but not... This is not a strong pain such as, like, being rejected, right? It is more of a... I would say, kind of a pain of existence, right? Going through that pain. The pain of being human day to day, right? And understanding what that means to a degree. I, I don't know what... Weltschmerz is the German word for it, right? In a way, right? It's comparable to that, right? Because you don't know what the answer is going to be. You do have that dread and anticipation and whatnot. Still, what tied Subaru over is that loving relationship that he has with her. That is still very, very intimate and very, very close. And that kind of fuels him because it gives him the idea that the answer is eventually going to be a positive one. And even if it's not, maybe that they can talk it out and process it and get through it together, right, in a way. But I don't think he considers the, 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 the answer to ever be a negative one. Because he has that at this point in time. Early or not, right? He, he was desperately clinging on to that in season one. But at this point, he does have that confidence to a degree. I know I'll fall in love with someone someday. And I've already decided who that someone will be when the time comes. Which is very interesting. That she's like, I don't know what it means yet. But I've already decided who it will be. And I, I guess in the realm of possibilities also that that decision will change. But at this point in time, she's steadfast in saying, if I'll ever, well, or I will eventually, that, that's what she's saying, I will eventually grasp all of it with its significance on an emotional level, um, on a sexual level as well, on, a, on, on an intellectual level, right? A level of like responsibility and, 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 and logic and all of that. I will understand all of that one day and i already know who i'm gonna turn to when i have decided for myself that i've understood it to in its entirety which like i said is very wise in a way in my opinion very mature probably in many ways more mature than season one subaru for example was and I mean, like I said, probably the most polite rejection anybody has ever had on screen. A selfish adulteress. <laughs> okay. Okay, my dude. And he was going for the for the kill, right? And this is where they both they kicked the door in and Raida just kicked it. <laughs> oh. I mean, great tension breaker, and also fucking hilarious. Dude, we both kicked at the same time, but the results were totally different. Busting into save the day moment is gonna look way cooler than mine now. <laughs> so was like, yeah, look at that. I wanted to look cool, and you were the one. Look at that face. That isn't love, I don't know. And obviously, the gauntlet has been thrown down now. Yeah, indeed, there were no men at all. In, in invited to the wedding that kind of proves to me how insecure you are regulars that you haven't invited any like male attendants or whatnot that all of your attendants are basically your wives i'm the spirit knight whose spirit partner is missing right super in his usual like quirky way and then successor of the master swordsman title reinhard van Estria. i object to this union as they say and like I said, he wanted to say that for a long time, but he didn't expect to say it in that way, right? The one I love someday. All right. I mean, honestly, you could have made a worse choice. You could have made a worse choice, for sure. This character keeps growing and it's amazing, right? No matter what you thought about him in the beginning of season one, right? No matter how quirky and stupid he can be sometimes, 
he always seems to rise to the occasion and that is what i love about him right that is what i love about the story because we have so a couple of characters who who are in the focus here and who do rise to the occasion it's not just subaru right amelia her amazing speech there right her conviction her, her calmness in, in in addressing this right and her reassuredness her trust in in subaru and whoever else he's gonna take with him to come and actually and actually come to a rescue and whatnot right be there when it matters and the same with everybody else we've, we've learned more and more about all of the candidates we learn more and more about everybody out there right and the more we learn the more we find out that all of these people have a lot have a lot to develop they have a lot to to understand and realize and but they keep growing they keep growing they keep they keep evolving they keep facing these challenges and if they stick together and trust one another even through tragedy and even though you can't prevent bad things from happening you can be sure that they will get through it the amazing thing about this Subaru hasn't died a lot in this season has he a lot of people like i've talked to who are like on the fence with re-zero right who are like okay I, i'm kind of enjoying re-zero yes but it's like not like like a lot of the things I hear, like, obviously there's a lot of criticism about ReZero that is valid in many ways. But I, one thing I hear a lot is the whole dying over and over again thing is starting to become boring, right? And washed out and it isn't as impactful anymore. Agreed. 100% agreed. But see what we're doing here? Like, see what we're doing here? This is not the focus anymore. Yes, it's still the gimmick, right? It's still one of the specialties of ReZero, right? To play with that and kind of mold the story in a way to just, right? To to, to create situations that are interesting or the, the combination stories, characters meeting that you want to tell in a way and not make it final, for example, right? Make people realize things without, right? And, and putting them in real mortal danger and death without that having to be a permanent thing but at the same time we're not overusing it anymore season one it was shock value and it was very effective right it was the horror it was the trauma in season two it was i think a central debate about subaru's mentality and how he's going into this and now in season three we are in the mindset of subaru being like i don't want to use this return by death as a crutch right i want to make things happen even if things are not perfect, right? I have that trust in friends and family and, and allies and whatnot that I can actually push through even if minor things are going wrong or people are, people are being kidnapped like Amelia here and I'm unsure how if, if they're doing well or whatever, right? That unwavering spirit of we can fix that because first of all, he realized that through his lesson with Satella and he also made it happen so he has a success example for that from his learning experience for challenging Roswell and being like, I'm going to do this in one loop and actually doing it in one loop. So it is possible. And he's trying to do that. Otherwise, I think old Subaru would have probably reset when he saw Krush being, being so heavily affected by the dragon's blood, right? Or him himself, right, with his leg and whatnot. Or Amelia being kidnapped, right? All of these things. But he's thinking beyond that, and we evolve beyond that on a storytelling level. This is not a plot device that's being abused at this point in time. It's a plot device that is complementary to the story, but it's not the focus anymore. The focus is a lot, lot of other things. And I love that, right? I love that. I love how every, like, the significance of all the little mechanics and elements that make ReZero what it is, right? That make ReZero unique are not static but they change in their significance, in the way we handle them, in the way we interact with them, and in the way they shape the story. But yeah, that was ReZero, Season 3, Episodes 7 and 8. I do hope you watched them both. I do hope you watched some of these uh, discussions. I do always appreciate if you watch it to the end. And I'll see you next time after the, after the eight-week pause, right? Next year, basically. See you then. Mm.